I'm starting my double page spread tutorial and this is for the painting portion of how I do double page spreads in 7 inch Kara. So this is a watercolor double page spread which makes it kind of a, a special beast. And I'm working on the floor because this takes up a lot of room. So the materials we're going to start with for stretching our two sheets of watercolor paper is one full size piece of gator board. I estimate this is about 24 inches by 36 inches. Your paper, your blue painter's tape, roll of paper towels that don't have a surface texture, that's kind of important, clean cup of water, clean spray bottle of water, a mop, and you're also going to need your bulldog clips and your binder clips. And I have to go dig mine up because mine have wandered away somewhere. So I'm gonna go find those and I'll, ah, okay, there they are. Perfect, got them right here in this shoe box. So when you're stretching watercolor paper, you wanna do it on a day that isn't too humid if you can possibly help it. So my Louisiana friends, my apologies, um, because your paper is gonna have a memory and it's going to always sort of warp or try to warp back into the form it had when it was first stretched. So if you're getting a lot of buckling, <laughs> now you know why. Um, and stretching it will help control the buckling and will help it mostly to dry flat. So I've got my two illustrations that I'm going to want to sort of paint side by side. It's fine if they're not exactly continuous. There are some things I can do digitally to sort of fool the eye if it looks too disparate. But what you really want is like color um, accuracy, color uh, continued throughout the page, because that'll help the viewer sort of fool the eye, I guess. I mean, it's not a true illusion, but if there's some areas that are not perfect, it'll help sell that. And I just found an area that uh, I actually neglected the pencil. So I'll fix that. And when I'm penciling these pages, I'm actually pe penciling over non-photo blue ink that was printed in my inkjet printer. This is water-based ink. So when I add the water on top of it, it'll sort of melt it away so it won't be noticeable. And um, I ink or I pencil on top of it. I don't ink it. I pencil on top of it with um, an HB lead because I found that softer leads, while they're darker, they tend to get picked up when I apply my water washes and they smear. Whereas a harder lead, like an HB lead, doesn't do that. And I apologize for the semi unprofessional recording. Um, situation. This is the best I have in my studio at this point in time. Um, someday we'll have a rig set up to record larger pieces. Um, right now we just don't really have the space for it. So when I'm painting multiple pages at one time or working on bigger pieces, I do tend to work on the floor rather than at the desk you guys are familiar with. And this gray thing I'm working on right now since people have asked me, is actually an anti-fatigue mat. Originally it was purchased because I intended to do craft fairs as an artist, but um, the logistics of that just weren't really favorable to the sort of work I produce. So um, instead it's now on my floor and I like to sit on it when I can because it sort of, you know, helps with fatigue. It, it prevents too much pressure from building up in my bones or, you know, pressure points, I should say. Uh, so I don't hurt as bad when I finish painting for the day. It used to be um, I would finish my painting day in like a lot of pain, but it has helped a lot. And I believe I ordered this mat, or this mat was purchased through from overstock.com in case you think this is a good idea. If you're an artist who works on your feet, maybe you work on like large acrylic paintings and you need to stand to work on them, um, an anti-fatigue mat might really be a great investment for you. The better care we take of ourselves, the longer we can work. So when I stretch these pages, I'm going to stretch them one at a time. And I'm going to start by turning it over to the back and saturating the back of my paper with my spray bottle. And then using my mop brush 
And this is just a synthetic Cotman mop brush. There's no, no need to really invest in an expensive mop brush. And I've had the same mop brushes for several years, so they will last you. This is just a Cotman 999. Cotman is Windsor and Newton student grade. So I'm gonna take my paper towels and I'm going to run them across the surface to absorb excess water. Flip my page over, align it on the board and then spray it down again. And this initial spray is just to reactivate that non-photo blue so it can come up. Take my brush, distribute the water across the page. And you wanna work as quickly as possible. So if you need to do some practice sessions, I recommend that. Now I'm gonna use that paper towel again to absorb not only the water this time, but the ink. And if there are areas that you know are a little bit resistant, you can go over them. Then I'm going to spray it down again. Mop up that water again and grab my blue painter's tape. I like to use, I think this is an inch and a half, but it might be two inches and this is three M's blue painter tape. I'm actually very specific about which painter's tape I like. Um, I find this one gives the best results and I have tried watercolor tape, which is, um, it is like a brown craft tape and you spread water on the back to activate it. And I find that it actually rips the paper. So this is what I personally prefer and recommend. Although different artists have different needs and different preferences. So um, I also suggest you experiment to find something that suits you. I wipe it down and I begin moving on to the next side. I'm gonna do all four sides. To help hold my paper in place, I'm gonna use these black binder clips. It just sort of helps to hold the paper down in areas that are kind of too far away from the edge for the um, binder clips to be effective. And I like to take down the longer sides first as they're the ones that are more prone to warping. So I'll start with one short edge, do the two long edges, and then finish up with the last short edge. And I find that I get the best results with that. Now it's time to move on to the second page and we repeat the process. It's okay if your tape overlaps, you just don't want your tape from one page to overlap onto the next page that sort of increases your risk of, of tearing when you remove the tape. I'm gonna have to find more binder clips. Anyway, uh, this is how I handle my watercolor double page spreads for my watercolor comic, Seven Inch Kara. I'm Becca Hilburn. I hope you guys found this tutorial helpful. I will see you in the next video when we start painting this. Bye. Hey guys, good evening. So we're continuing our work on this double page spread. And today we're gonna do some toning. And what you want for toning is a mop, a cup of clean water, a dish of clean water that you can use to mix up your wash and your paints. And what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna go ahead and activate the paints you want to use a few minutes before you intend on painting. So I went ahead and did that. And since this is an early morning outdoor scene, I want um, very, like a yellow wash all over the hole. And the yellows I'm using are tending more towards the cool side. Since I, so I can kind of capture that early morning sort of feeling. 
So when you apply a wash on a regular watercolor, you're gonna wanna elevate your page and work with um, from top to bottom. And to elevate your page, you really just want a few inches. This is actually a little bit too high. You try to find something lower than this. I mean, even this will work. You really just want a slight angle to your painting. And we're just going to apply a light work wash at first. And if I decide there needs to be more color, I can darken it later on. And you don't really want to go by how the color looks while it's wet because watercolor dries a little bit lighter. So if it looks too dark at first, just uh, let it dry before you really decide. And even if it's too dark, there are a lot of ways you can sort of salvage that. So we're applying the first wash across these two pages. Not really doing any fancy tricks. And the paper I'm using is Canson Montval, which is not really considered a quality watercolor paper but it works really well for me for watercolor comics. It's economical. I can run it through my printer um, and it handles in a way that I can predict. So I enjoy working with it, but I recommend you find a paper that works for you. I tested several before I decided on Montval. All right, so I'm gonna let this fully dry before I add my next layer of wash. All right, so my first layer has dried and I'm gonna mix a little bit more of the yellow into my wash. And the reason we're doing this is we're basically toning the page and this is gonna influence how all of the colors look. So on pages where I've applied a darker wash first, it gives the whole page an overall darker appearance. Um, and it really makes my job of setting the mood a lot easier. Um, and this is really the step when you want to do this sort of thing, because if you wait to try and tone the page when the, the page is like painted over, you're going to end up reactivating some of the pigments. So this sort of large scale glaze is best done early on. Now you can um, basically do the same thing digitally. Um, and I can show you guys that in another video, but I like to do as much on the actual page as I possibly can. All right, so now my job is to let this dry again. Hey guys, so my first two washes have dried. Well, for the most part, um, the paper is cool and dry to the earth. It's dry to the touch and is no longer cool. And um, those are, you know, two of the signs that let you know that your wash is dry. But um, my paper is still a little bit rippled, which lets me know it hasn't dried out completely. But I am ready to move on. So I wanted to do a green wash where the grass is. So I have another um, little bowl of water, clean water. And I'm mixing in some Hooker's Green with a little bit of green gold because I want like a, a bright light wash and I kind of just want it to be a tint to like influence everything that is within the grass. So I can go a little green on that. I am using this large round, I believe it's a 26 round and I'm pretty much just applying it, the green to everything that's in the grass area. And this is going to be such a light green that it's really just going to look like um, ref reflected color rather than like, oh, she's green like an alien. Which means I do need to soak up any pool green because any sort of variation in color is going to make it noticeable. And I just want it to be an influence. I don't want it to be. Um, very noticeable. And this is just a large, inexpensive synthetic 
around that's sort of ideal for these sort of large scale water applications where I might need a point to pull in some detail. Now, if you have too much paint or paint at all in an area where you don't really want there to be paint, you can always pull it up again while it's still wet by using a clean paper towel. Just dabbing it like so. And if you find you've pulled up color from an area where you actually did want color, you can go back in and carefully add it. Also, if you find your color pooling, you can dry your brush out in your paper towel and just run it over the area again, and that'll absorb the excess liquid. And just keep dabbing it back into your paper towel to uh, dry it out. All right, so yet again, we're going to allow this to sit and dry before we can move on. All right, guys, so my wash has basically dried. So I want to mix certain areas of it a little bit deeper. So I'm going to take a little bit more of the Hunter's Green I'd originally mixed in, as well as some of the Windsor and Newton Green Gold. Um, and if any of you guys read my comic, Seven Inch Carol, or have read volume one, you guys will know that grass is sort of a, a much practiced thing for me. So I'm going to do another wash of this green. And I'm not really bothering to mask areas out, partially because masking fluid has um, just sort of not really been a product that I've found useful in my studio. It's had a lot of problems, but also because I don't really need to mask out those um, dandelions in the background. I am, however, working around the dandelion in the foreground as well as Kara here in the foreground because I already want to start building up areas of contrast. And anywhere the gray green sort of sneaks into where I don't want it, I'm going to take my paper towel and sponge it up while it's still wet. And as you can see, the key for painting, watercolor painting, a double page spread, isn't to do the whole spread, but rather to have, um, to be able to work on the two halves at the same time. So I'm not trying to like go across both pieces of paper, but I can work on both simultaneously and make the same decisions. So that means the, the two halves are consistent. And just as before, I'm going to mop up some of these areas that are just pooled color. And let this dry. Hey guys, so I'm back, finally able to resume working on this double page spread tutorial. This double page spread, in case I haven't told you guys, is from volume two of my ongoing watercolor comic, Seven Inch Kara you can pick up volume one in my online shop and that would be super amazing for me. I would really appreciate it. And you can check out the link for that right here. Um, it's especially great if you like my art because it's a comic made by me, so it's full of my art. Um, I apologize if you guys can't see this. I will try to change up my shots as I can. Um, I've already explained that the floor is the biggest area I have open for something as big as a double page spread. And I wanted you guys to see the process 
sort of in a general sense rather than the specific methods of painting. I do have painting tutorials. I have two comic painting tutorials up that you can check out. This is really just to cover how I handle doing something as large as a double page spread. So we've already toned the grass. Now it's time to tone the house and the stairs and the rocks in the foreground. And you're going to want two cups, clean water. One is going to be your clean cup. One is going to be your dirty cup. I highly recommend you do not use drinking cups ever for your watercolors. Not only will you make the mistake of possibly drinking your watercolor water, but it, you know, if you don't get them perfectly clean, you can make yourself really sick. A lot of watercolor colors um, have been shown have, have, have lead to cancer. So please, please do not use your drinking utensils for your watercolor cups. I have um, a couple of favorite Castell collapsible cups. I've had them for years. They were like seven bucks each worthwhile investment because I don't drink out of my watercolor water and it's got these little crenellations at the top which will hold your brushes in place. Great investment, I really enjoy them. You're also going to want some fairly large brushes. These can be synthetics. Synthetics are always cheaper than natural brushes unless you catch some sort of crazy sale. Um, you're gonna want some watercolor wells or watercolor palettes to paint the way I do. If you paint in a different method, you may not need them. For washes, I have actually repurposed a tray that once held mochi ice creams. I've had it about a year now. It might be time to replace it, but it was free. I'm mean, free for the cost of mochi ice cream, which I already enjoy. And I also use this inexpensive little plastic palette. You can get these at Michael's, at Walmart, through Dick Blick. You know, they're really, really commonly available. You're also going to want your watercolors. <clears throat> And you're probably going to want a pipette if you can get one. Uh, mine has disappeared, so I'm just going to pour using one of the crenellations to help guide the water. And I'm going to start mixing up the color of the brick on Naomi's house. And these, this is um, a self-assembled palette, custom assembled to my taste in color. Uh, some of these colors actually need to be like scraped out because I didn't use them. So uh, you're going to find, if you decide you want to do a watercolor comic, that my palette won't work, may not work for you, and your palette might not work for me. So it's important to sort of experiment and find something that works for you. And the purpose of toning isn't to get the exact color, it's just to sort of block in fields of color. It makes it easier and quicker to paint later on. And I am painting on Canton Montval paper, which is not the best watercolor paper, but as I've explained in prior videos, it runs through my printer, which is necessary for one of the transfer techniques I, I rely on. Um, it runs through my printer. It is relatively inexpensive. I can find it pretty, pretty consistently. It comes in the size I need and it is economical. It also works okay for watercolor pages because um, it, is capable of holding crisp detail that I can't always get with arches. You're also going to want a roll of paper towels. Paper towels are kind of a lifesaver when it comes to this sort of work. And you're going to want to be able to, if you don't have a good memory, and I don't, you may want your prior pages as reference. So I'll go ahead and pull out this cover and I have a tutorial on painting the cover. You can check that out right here. I recommend you do check it out. In fact, if you haven't already, it's long, but you know, it's pretty much a faithful representation of my watercolor painting process. And if you are interested in doing this yourself, you sort of need to know what you're getting in for. And anytime my water sort of, my paint sort of just slops over, I just use my paper towel to gently pick it up. And I use Viva paper towels. I am a big fan of their paper towels and I feel like they work really well for this because I use the non-textured, non-colored kind. So I don't get any sort of um, 
you know, dye leaking into my watercolors. I don't know if that will happen, but I don't want to find out. And I don't get any sort of a texture. So when I'm picking up colors, it's just, you know, cleanly picking up the whole area. You might want to play around though with textures. It could be a fun way to sort of change things up for your, for your work. Now, while I wait for this to dry, I'm gonna go ahead and mix up the color I'm gonna use for the pavement and the stones. And for that, I want a Payne's Gray, which is a very blue gray, a cool blue gray, in fact. And some sepia. And that's gonna make sort of a cement gray because we basically mixed two very muted complements. So I need to allow the brick at the top to dry before I can really progress with that. And I'll go ahead and apply color to the dandelion in the foreground. Nice bright yellow. I don't want to go too dark too quick because I want to be able to leave highlights and build up tone. Cause like that's, um, for my watercolor pages, the sort of bouncy contrast, I feel like really sort of exemplar exemplifies where volume two has gone, which I, I like. I've learned a lot about watercolor in the past year. Done a bunch of studies. I like how, even though this had no cat hair on it, it is now covered in cat hair, which is kind of gross, but that's what happens when you work on the floor and you have a cat who has to be all up in your business at all times. Also going to go ahead, since Kara's outfit is yellow on this page, I'll lay in that. It looks like the house, at least, is ready for the first layer of concrete. That's Bowie, who has to be involved in all things. Now to let this dry, but first I'm going to go ahead and mix up Kara and Naomi's skin tones. And I'll switch over to a slightly smaller brush. So for Kara, it is yellow ochre and scarlet. And that makes a nice sort of Caucasian skin tone. Now for Naomi, I'm gonna have to go ahead and activate some of the, the pigments first. So I'll let those sort of activate and I'll get back to you. All right, so I've given my pigments a little bit of time to get activated. What you're really doing is you're sort of reconstituting the binders that are used in sort of dry watercolors. That's why sometimes if you don't, um, if you don't activate your pigments first and you start painting, that's why your your paints will seem or they'll be very faint and very light, kind of hard to use when you first start using them, and then they'll get uh, progressively easier to use and um, sort of richer as time goes by. And you don't want to start off too dark because it's not going to give you anywhere to sort of build up to. 
So I'm starting sort of pale and I'll build up color as time progresses. One of the nice things about paper towel, especially the Beeble ones, is they can be kind of fashioned into a straight edge so you can very cleanly clean up uh, straight lines. Alright, so it's time for me to let this dry for a little while, kind of step away, give it time, um, and come back to it in a little bit. So I'll see you guys in a while. Alright, so I thought I was recording and I wasn't, and then my camera turned itself off and that's how I figured out I wasn't recording. So I thought maybe going this mode might even be better. I started in by blocking in the light source for some of the major forms. So I've started darkening the, um, the part under the house, the cement part under the house, as well as the stairs. Also started darkening in the rocks, starting to indicate where light is. And I started to darken in Kara's little tunic thing. Um, the next step is I want to block in Naomi's outfit and then I'm going to start blocking in all of the grass and I can't do painting with the handy cam sort of you know what I mean where I'm holding the camera because my hands will shake really badly so I apologize that we don't currently have a better view I realize this view would be a lot more helpful for you guys but um yeah, we're, I'm working within my means. I would love a better setup at some point, but that is kind of an expensive investment. So next, I want to block in Naomi's clothes, block in that door in the background, and block in that kick plate. So for Naomi's outfit, I think, I know I had something noted in her character design for this chapter, but I think I'm going to change it based on what Kara's wearing. So I want Naomi wearing a blue shirt and I think I'm gonna go with colored jeans. Maybe I'll just go with very light colored jeans. So I'm activating those pans. guys so my page has had plenty of time to dry now I can um, move on and sort of work on cleaning a few things up tightening a few things darkening a few things I want to mix my brick color a little bit darker
start adding some brick details. As you guys can imagine, it's actually pretty painful and frustrating having to paint like this. This is not a recommended position. Usually I would have this lifted up into my lap at least, but uh, I can't really do that. So I really hope this video is helpful and inspiring to some of you guys. It inspires you to try making a watercolor comic, maybe, or maybe it tells you that, you know, you really just don't want to make a watercolor comic because it is a lot of work. Either way, I hope this comes to something that is useful for somebody. And it's not just me breaking my back on the floor and no one benefits from that. So right now I'm just sort of gesturally blocking in the bricks. Go back and soak up areas that were a little oversaturated, clean up any sort of residual mess. Also wanna finish or uh, put another layer on Naomi's shorts with some Payne's Gray. Unfortunately, that's a little too dark. Mix that concrete a little bit darker for next time. Also going to start mixing um, a white that can be used for shading. And I've gone over this sort of shadow white with you before. little bit of neutral tint, a little bit more. Too much. A little bit of purple or violet, but usually purple because it's a little bluer, a little bit of Payne's gray. Fluffs in the dandelion. All right, time to step away again and let this dry. All right, guys, we have made enough progress that it's time to start working on the grass. And I'm gonna need a fair bit of water. So I go ahead and pour it into one of my larger wells. And since this is sort of morning time grass, I'm going to activate Windsor Newton's Green Gold. And um, I think it's Daniel Smith Hunter Green to begin with. And I'm also determining a plan of action because one of the ways grass turns muddy is when you just sort of paint the whole thing. And I will not, I'm not gonna demonstrate it, so I'm gonna try to demonstrate the opposite, but I need to be able to think, so I'm gonna get quiet. Fortunately, must have had a lot of paint on the brush and not enough in the well because I'm not getting as dark color when I redip. So I'll mix it a little more. I gotta let this dry some before I can go back and darken it up a bit. What I'm also trying to do is create areas of sort of dappled sunlight and zones. So we have a foreground zone, which needs to be darker than the background zone since the grass is so much in focus. See, if we applied this next green overall, instead of leaving lots of area of the lighter wash, um, it would really start to look swampy. You really want to leave lots of light bouncing around 
to make it look uh, grassy. And also these sort of areas of pooled color, um, you don't want to encourage that too much because that's another thing that's going to end up making it look really swampy. And you're going to want, especially in the foreground, you're going to want as much contrast as you can possibly build up. You also want to give your grass time to dry between applications so that when you lay down your next set of marks, they'll be nice and crisp. All right, so I'm gonna start mixing my color a little bit darker and give this Plenty of time to dry. All right, guys, it's been a few hours since I last put some paint on the paper. Everything is nice and dry, so it's time to revisit. And I'm still working on rendering out that grass. You guys can see I'm trying to leave some islands in here. Unfortunately, I really didn't mix my green dark enough, so there's not really gonna be um, enough contrast. to start getting earnest about mixing the hooker's green in and it might even be time to start adding in a little bit of a bluish or a um, green influenced blue and to let this dry because if I apply it now it's gonna start really looking pretty muddy guys so uh, the painting is dried overnight and I can finally get to the next stage unfortunately I left my water cups in the bathroom like a genius it's best to start your painting day with two fresh cups and we're still working on that grass I did fill in some color on other areas um, but it's not really the most important aspect of this tutorial. With filling in grass, especially at this sort of larger scale, you do want to leave in those islands of um, unfilled in color. It'll help break it up, make it look less like a swampy mess. So from this point on with the grass, I'm going to be working mostly with pure color because I'm having difficulty building up enough contrast using washes. And I'll move the camera over so you guys can see what I'm talking about. 
As you guys can see, it's starting to get a little swampy. We're starting to lose a lot of the finer details. That's when you really want to switch over to a higher area of contrast. I'm sorry, a rather um, a higher contrast color. And for me, that's going to mean working directly from the pigment, which was Hunter's Green. All right, so my grass has dried. It's time to do the next layer. So I'm pretty much working straight with the hooker's green. And if I get too much on my brush, I just dab it off onto the blue painter's tape. And the only problem with that is sometimes you'll drag your hand into it before it's dry and you'll get it all over the place. So just be careful with that if you decide to, you know, steal my bad habits. And since I'm working directly with the, the paint, like in an un unadulterated form, I'm gonna work kind of slowly and in layers. And the hardest part is working around the figure because I don't really want the grass to look like it just stops when it hits Kara, but I also don't want to over like paint on top of her, which would be the most realistic looking way to do it because it would lead to uninterrupted grass but uh and I could mask off with that but I've been having a lot of really bad experiences with masking solutions lately even masking frisket which I use for my alcohol marker stuff uh I've just been having a lot of like seepage problems so it's not really a solution now what I could do is I could do a wax resist, but that would mean I couldn't work on her any further because it would re resist the green of the grass, but it would also resist any color I tried to put on her. So when I paint grass, I try to use long fluid strokes, very similar to actual blades of grass, um, whenever possible. Of course, going over the body makes that not so possible. So it's actually much easier when I'm not working around her. I can work a lot quicker. And the intention is not to fill it in, it's to leave plenty of white or plenty of, um, you know, areas that haven't been over colored. And that way it'll read a little bit better as grass. Even down in the areas that would be shadow. You want to leave area pockets of like white or lighter color. Because grass isn't a solid mass. It's, you know, a collection of blades of grass, individual strokes. I think clovers can be rib uh, rendered as um, just sort of gestural scribbles, leaving lots of areas of white or lighter color. And of course, working around that big dandelion also presents a challenge. And of course, oh shoot, you're not tied to any particular, I was only leaving my page in one orientation uh, for, you know, better recording, but you can rotate it as much as you need to, just don't uh, spill your paint the way I did. Of course, once I start laying down a field of color, I really find it disruptive to stop what I'm doing. So I will clean that up in a couple minutes. Off camera, of course. And this is where having a calligrapher's bridge would be really helpful. What that is, is it's um, a piece of wood or acrylic that sits a lot closer to your work surface than say a traditional mall stick, which would go across and it's a thing for you to rest your hand on. Um, so you're not straining your hand as much as you would if 
as if you were using a regular mall or bridge, but you're also not risking getting your hand in the paint and it allows you to work. It's a lot easier to work with, it seems like. And you can bring that saturated green up higher into the picture plane with just some delicate strokes. It sort of marries the foreground and the background together, makes them look like they belong in the same image. Or you can wait until your foreground has dried to do this or switch to a smaller brush if you really want to. But you know, I always advise that you work with the largest brush you can comfortably handle for the subject matter you're rendering. Um, and for me, it helps things from becoming, you know, sort of over rendered or muddy. You can also save the background grass for when you're paint, when you're using your watercolor pencils, if you choose to use watercolor pencils. So I'm going to clean up my mess and let this dry. And I'll take you guys over for a closer look at what I'm doing. All right, so that layer of grass has had plenty of time to dry, and I've gone ahead and activated a green uh, tinted blue. And dark blue slash blue greens are really good for shading in grass, especially in the extreme foreground here. At this stage, you might have to work a little slower and you may have to switch over to a smaller brush. You can also dilute your, um, your greenish blue or your green hued blue uh, for shading in the background, which is what I'll be doing in a little bit. So I'm going to let this set dry before I move on. And you can see how the blue divides the grass up, cools it down a little bit, and definitely suggests some definition of shadow. You can further enhance that with uh, watercolor pencils or color pencils, which I'll be using at a later stage. Hey guys! So it's been a few hours since I last applied some paint to the page. Um, and I'm working on adding blue sort of shadow here to the grass. And I hope you guys have at least taken away from watching me do watercolors. Um, that any watercolor, big or small, is mostly broken up into a series of smaller steps. And sometimes it just takes a little bit longer than you think it will, and that's okay. You know, one of the big virtues when it comes to learning how to do watercolor is having enough patience to do watercolor. And if you're like me, if you struggle with that, Sometimes you have to have other things going on in your day to sort of keep you from overworking or making bad decisions because, you know, they used to say, and they might still, when I was in school, that 80% of any piece you do is the thinking. So it really helps, especially in watercolor, to go in with a bit of a game plan, sort of know what you want to do. Especially if you're doing a spread like this where it can get away from you pretty quickly. You start looking terrible if you're not careful. Having a game plan definitely 
helps you break it down into manageable chunks. And having a plan also helps you be patient because you're not reacting. You're, you're creating the situations instead of trying to solve situations as they pop up. And like I mentioned in some of the other videos in this series, um, the sort of watercolors I do for comics are not the same as, not necessarily the same as the way anybody else would do it or the way a fine artist might go about creating a watercolor piece. So, you know, take what you can from what I'm showing you and be prepared to find your own way to get things done to solve problems. So for the most part, my grass is finished. I am gonna add some detail, it's using um, watercolor pencils later on, but I don't wanna overwork the grass too much. Switch to a slightly smaller brush, add some details back over here. And for my comic pages, I work primarily with rounds other than a mop. On very rare occasion, I might use a flat. Rounds just, you know, are kind of my workhorses. They get a lot of, get a lot of work out of them. So to brighten up the foreground grass just a little bit, I'm using some of this Winsor Newton green gold just to knock some hopefully yellow tones into the foreground grass, make them look a little bit brighter, more, more alive. grass if you go a little too dark and you wait till the end you can add a little bit of green especially with the Derwent color soft pencils because those are a little more opaque than some you can add some of that green back in so over here I might have to add some green back because I feel like I'm losing some of the sort of um, bright freshness that you'd see in morning grass. Hey guys, so last night I finished working on the grass. Oh, didn't mean to zoom in that much. At least for now, I'm going to tighten it up with those watercolor pencils I mentioned. Um, but for now, it's good. I've also started tightening up the dandelion in the foreground, as well as adding detail to Naomi in the background. And these are things that would be difficult for me to show you with the camera angle um, where it has been for the majority of this video. So I just went ahead and did it and started adding detail to the porch, filled in the grate, and started adding more detail to Kara. This is a pretty simple double page spread um, in that the image is continuous across the whole. There are no panels going across it. I like to keep my double page spreads for a seven inch care pretty simple, open and inviting, something easy for the kids to read, sort of um, a welcome respite. You know, I just want them to take a few minutes and just enjoy or imagine themselves in that situation. So I really wanted like the luscious grass going across the foreground. Um, I really wanted it to be something that piqued their imagination. I also was careful not to have any figures, any human figures going across the divide because that can be very hard to handle properly. 
and it would also mean you see where this divide is that's where the crease in the book is going to be as well so you can really lose a lot of a person in that crease it's fine for the rock i'm a little concerned about the porch um especially the way I had to handle double page spreads in volume one. CreateSpace had a lot of uh, sort of restrictions about that sort of thing. So I had to sort of work around what they could do. Um, but in general, even if you're working with a really good publisher, even if you're working or printer, even if you're working um, with like a floppy rather than a trade, style book um, where you might actually have that middle page that doesn't have any any sort of crease or divide it would lay flat if left open um, you still sort of want to plan around the worst case scenario because there's a lot that can go wrong that's out of your hands and in the printer's hands so I just wanted to give you guys a close-up of that
right guys, so I changed up my shot a little bit so we can get some over the shoulder action. Hopefully this is easier for you to see, easier for me to paint. Um, so for the most part, this is finished. Uh, what we still need to do is some fine details using watercolor, some details using color pencils and watercolor pencils. Well, technically these are ink pencils, but I have referred to them as watercolor pencils in the past and I will probably continue to do so because they're water activated. As well as white gouache. And that tail you see swishing in the background is my lazy cat Bowie, who is looking to get into trouble. Still trying to figure out a way to juggle this. And I think fine details are something I haven't really been able to um, be able to demonstrate for you guys. Oh, this is going to be hard. I'm trying to size up my shot and where it works for me to see it, you guys can't see it. And what I mean by fine details is basically just going in with a very, oh shoot, very fine brush and just adding accents of color or, uh, you know, defining forms a little bit more clearly. Of course, there's a little too much paint on this brush. My intention is to add just enough detail so that everything looks sharp. At least more sharp than it looks right now. Sharper, I guess. Alright guys, so the paint I just applied had time to dry. Now I can start moving on. And I've switched over to watercolor pencils. Although this one is not quite as bright and pop-ish as I hoped. It's a grass screen. I was hoping it would show up a little more opaque than it actually is. But that makes it pretty good actually for adding grass detail. And I have talked about Derwent uh, Intense pencils a few times on the channel. Um, I don't think I've ever done a formal review of them. Uh, so I'll give you guys a quick rundown right now. I've been using Inktense pencils for um, almost as long as I've been working on Kara, uh, both volume one and volume two. So that's like five years now. Um, and they are my favorite quote unquote watercolor pencil. And I put that in quotes because every time I call them watercolor pencils, somebody comments that they're not watercolor pencils. And they're not, they're ink pencils. They are indelible once dry, which is, um, I mean, there are a lot of watercolors that are indelible once dry as well. So, you know, sometimes the distinction is a little bit arbitrary, um, but they are, they're ink tense. So even the pencils themselves refer to themselves, are ref you know what I mean? They refer to themselves as being ink pencils. So I will go with it. Um, indelible means once you put water on top of them, they're not, you're not going to be able to move them. So once they've been activated and dry, that's where they're going to be. Um, that means you can apply a wash with them and then you can do washes on top of that or glazes on top of that. And the intense is going to stay in place instead of turning into kind of a muddy mess which, you know, is really great if you do, I think it's really great if you do watercolor comics. So, um, I don't know off the top of my head how many intense uh, pencils there are available, uh, how many colors there are available. Um, 
and I do know that they are open stock through Jerry's Artorama in person for sure. Um, and maybe through their website as well. They're also available in sets and they're becoming increasingly common in the U.S. Derwent is an English uh, brand and they've been uh, brought over by Cole Arts, C-O-L hyphen A-R-T-S, the same company that handles Windsor Newton right now. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're a pretty quality product. I enjoy using them. I'm happy with the results. Uh, I don't leave any of my pieces out in direct sunlight and I don't really display a lot of my pieces. Most of my pieces are intended for reproduction. So I scan them and then I sequester them away. So I can't tell you how light fast they are. I'm sure that information is available on their website if you are so inclined to find out. And I really like using Inktense pencils when I'm rendering grass. I feel like they help me, um, you know, create the definition I'm looking for without things becoming too muddy. Um, in earlier pages, I was really reliant on watercolor pencils when rendering grass. Now I'm a little more proficient at rendering grass with watercolor. So uh, I usually, usually just leave them for like the final details. I think Derwent's are a valuable asset though to any watercolor artist, especially watercolor comic artists who might need to be able to render very fine details. And I've re replaced a few individual colors, but I've had the same set for almost uh, five years now. So, you know, a little does go a long way. Something you should keep in mind though about intense color pencils is they are a lot more intense when you add water to them. They really pack a punch. And if you want to add opaque layers of color, then you really ought to give the Derwent Color Soft Color Pencils a try. They're a little bit softer, more pastel-like, without being pastels or chalks, than um, some of the other color pencils I've used. They're not quite as brittle as Prismacolor pencils. And they can be helpful to add hints of opaque color where you may have over-rendered something or lost some of the, you know, the, the contrast. I'm not a color pencil artist though, or I don't consider myself to be a color pencil artist. I really just use them for accents for the most part on watercolor pieces. So if you're looking for an actual, um, actual advice or recommendations on color pencils, I have a couple of YouTube channels to recommend. One is Owings Art. Um, and the other one is Lacry Fine Art, I believe. Both of them have reviewed color pencils. I know Lacry is, um, specifically does a lot of stuff in color pencil as the main medium. So those are good sources to check out if you're looking for color pencil recommendations. usually save adding white for as close to the end as possible. Sometimes I may go over it again with a different color, but usually white is the end of the line. Right here is a white color soft that I'm using to add sort of that um, like touch of, of sunlight, touch of light back in the areas that may have been mishandled a little bit. 
And if I want to add more white, I can always go over it with the gouache, but sometimes it's better to build it up a little bit. I find that um, trying to build up contrast, sort of like a bounciness of color, makes for really um, vibrant watercolor paintings, watercolor illustrations. Unfortunately, the difficulty is finding a, a printer or a publisher that can replicate that look, and sometimes that's really difficult. Right, guys I think this spread is just about done all that really remains is to take it off the stretcher boards scan it and uh, you know basically put it with the rest of the chapter so um really though doing a double page spread at least for me in watercolor isn't all that different from doing any other set of pages I do like to do my pages side by side um, so I can sort of carry things over. It helps if they're aligned. I could have done a better job aligning it, but it would help if they were better aligned because then I could just sort of carry my line work over a lot more easily. Um, you can see Naomi in the background playing with Pancake, Kara in the foreground heading on over. You can see the porch with a little soda and tiny zebra cake. You can see under the house grating and dandelion puff and a big dandelion and I might go in and add some more um, clovers by hand but I don't think I'm gonna do that on camera so I hope this video uh, gave you guys some ideas some inspiration maybe made you want to try your own double page spread yourself you it's really not that intimidating once you know how to go about setting it up um, 
I wish you guys good luck. I hope this inspires you to work on your own comics. And I hope you guys will check out 7 Inch Kara Volume 2 when I'm ready to release it. Um, if you enjoy content like this, there are a couple ways you can help me out if you'd so desire. One, you can subscribe to my channel for even more content like this. Subscribing helps me out a lot because it kind of boosts where my videos show up in terms of YouTube and other people who are maybe looking for this sort of content, um, but maybe are having trouble finding it. Then, you know, if I'm more popular, they may be able to find it a little more easily. Two, it helps my bottom line in that um, I make a little bit more money off of ads, etc., which, you know, enables me to make more common comments, comics, and uh, more videos. Uh, another thing you can do is you can hit like on this video. Uh, that'll show other people that you enjoyed this content, that uh, you found this useful. Of course, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. So please go ahead and leave a comment down below. Uh, I'll try to get back to, to you as soon as I can. If you need a more immediate response and you don't want to wait, you can... Uh, use the, the email contact form over on my blog to send me a quick and easy email. You don't even have to include your own email address, although including it means I can answer you uh, because, <laughs> you know, with the comment form, all I can do is like do a general reply. Sorry, it's hard for me to think and paint sometimes because I'm trying to align the camera with uh, what I'm doing. Um, another way you can help me out, and this is a big one, is sharing this video to your social networks, sharing this video with your friends, uh, maybe sharing it to your Facebook. And there are social media share buttons right below this video, so you could just use those. Uh, it's another way to help me build my audience which, you know, helps me out a lot and it's always super appreciated. Right now, my, at, t at the time of this recording, so it may not be at the time of posting, trying to reach 2.5, 2.5K, 2.5 thousand, 2,500, however you wanna say it, subscribers, uh, so I can release the prize for my 2.5K giveaway, which is, you know, currently in the works. So uh, if that's still an issue at the time, when this video goes live and hopefully it will not be an issue hopefully we will have met that goal uh you know that would be a really huge way to help me out i would really 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 appreciate it um lastly you can help me out by checking out and possibly even contributing to my patreon um there are comic related goals including seven inch kara tiers where you can unlock comic pages not only for yourself but for other people who other patrons um so you can check that out at patreon.com slash natosuit and that would really be a big help um if you enjoy content like this and you want more of it you can check out my intro to comic craft playlist of which this video is a part uh, you can also check out my blog at natosoup.blogspot.com. I have seven years worth of comic and art tutorials and posts, including um, all sorts of goodies from my time at SCAD when I was getting my master's in sequential art. That's right, guys. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. Um, so I think, I think I'm really just making conversation while I paint in little clover flowers. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was inspiring. I will see you guys later on. Uh, so have a good day. Bye.